It's usually only when America's in its deepest trouble that they look around. <laughs> what these Negroes got to say about this? <laughs> We're not used to being terrorized. You have. What you got to say? We're not used to high levels of unemployment and underemployment. What you got to say? We're not used to decrepit schools. What you got to say? We're not used to dilapidated housing. What you got to say? We're not used to being hated. What you got to say? And it didn't have to be that way. If Frederick Douglass had said, I want to terrorize folk been terrorizing me for so long. I'm tired of it. If Mamie Teal that very moment had said, I believe in counterterrorism. That's my baby down there, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But Mamie, wasn't you told that eye for eye and tooth for tooth leaves us toothless and blind? <laughs> Heard that in Sunday school, don't believe it no more. <laughs> or Martin Luther King Jr. when he gave the eulogy for the four precious babies, the four girls at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. Tears coming from his eyes. He said, somehow in the face of this terror, we've got to muster courage to deploy the weapons of love and justice. They didn't have to read Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice, to know the difference between justice and revenge. You see, I say to my white brothers and sisters all around the country, when you see Negroes, you ought to just give them a standing ovation. <laughs> Thank you for generating high quality leadership in such a way that you didn't opt for a black Al Qaeda, but rather the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. that said that we would rather be defeated at the moment with moral integrity than win and be gangsters like the folk who have gangsterized our own babies and others. Oh yes, that's serious business. Without that legacy, we'd have had a civil war every generation, civil strife every other week. Brother West, that sounds like you're talking about black supremacy. No, not at all. Not at all. I'm talking about the best of black leadership and followership that, is, that was dominant for so long. But that's what takes us to our present moment. And that's why Brother Martin Luther King Jr. weeps from the grave. He weeps from the grave. You say, Brother West, how can that be so? You got that brilliant, charismatic black man in the White House. His brilliant, charismatic wife and those two precious girls who were growing so quickly. And you say, oh, Martin would applaud. My dear brother, your dear brother, Barack Obama, he's a sign of magnificent progress in America. It's not a sign of America being post-racial. He's a sign of America being less racist. <laughs> That's worthy of acknowledgement. That's a beautiful breakthrough. But Martin Luther King Jr. coming out of the legacy of Athens and Jerusalem, in which the loving kindness that Hesed has to do with orphan and stranger, and the poor, the widow, the prisoner, <laughs> coming back. USA 2012, he would look up and say, oh, you got some black folk who have actually pierced the glass ceiling. That's wonderful. I've always known there were brilliant, charismatic black people. I grew up among many in Atlanta. He said, but oh, I want to keep track as well with those stuck in the basement of the house. Let me go to the prisons. My God. Two and a half million folk in prisons. 1980 only had about 400,000. 300 billion dollars invested in jails and prisons in the criminal justice system in the last 27 years. That's a Marshall Plan, but it's a penal carceral Marshall Plan. You say you don't have money for education. You say you don't have money for housing. You say you don't have money for jobs with a living wage. You say you don't have money for health care. You say you don't have money for environmental protection. But we notice when it comes to prisons and jails, you can find the money just like you can find the money for the wars you want to fight. You, you can find money for Iraq. You can find money for Afghanistan. You can find money for drones dropped on innocent people in Pakistan and Yemen, but you can't find money for poor people and working people, no matter what color they are. Something's wrong with your priorities. 
Martin, we still love you. You love us too. We need to hear from you now. We in deep trouble, Brother Martin. Martin said, oh, we had a revolution against British monarchy in 1776. Even after we had stolen the land of our precious indigenous brothers and sisters, and we had guerrilla warfare against British imperialism, and I'm an anti-imperialist, so I'm in solidarity in part with the founding fathers. I know they're white supremacists and slaveholders, so I couldn't be full-fledged, member. But I'm an anti-imperialist. They were too. And then there was slavery. Another revolution was required. And I can hear Brother Martin Luther King Jr. saying through his tears, when I look at America now and I see 1% of the population owning 42% of the wealth, I look around, I see 400 individuals having wealth equivalent to the bottom 150 million people in America. He says, a key sweat moment. Something, something just ain't right. <laughs> something, something just ain't right. We got greed running amok. Top 1% has 95% of the income growth in the last 10 years. Wages stagnating, declining for the masses of working people. One out of two Americans now in poverty or near poverty, says the recent report. 22% of our precious children of all colors living in poverty and another 35 near poverty in the richest nation of the history of the world where levels of productivity have been escalating exponentially in the last 30 years, but the wealth is hemorrhaged at the top. Call oligarchy, Martin would say. And that's precisely why Martin was in part put to death. And when he died, when they shot our dear brother down like a dog on that balcony in Lorraine Motel in the Blue City, Memphis, Tennessee, Brother Martin had 72% disapproval among all Americans and 55% disapproval among black Americans. We don't like to be reminded of that because everybody loves Martin now. Now that his body's in the grave and the worms got him. No, when he was alive, the FBI said he's the most dangerous man in the country. He's the biggest notorious liar in the country. And more and more of black leadership that was afraid of Martin as he critiqued the Vietnam War, as he's trying to bring poor people together, he said, you're going too far, you're going too far, Martin. Martin said, no, I'm an extremist of love. No, I love the people enough to tell them the truth, to bear witness, and if I have to die, I don't want to die, but my God tells me I got to be true to my calling, and my calling is to make sure that the suffering here is connected to the suffering in Vietnam, the suffering in Latin America, the suffering in Eastern Europe at that time under a vicious form of Soviet communism. I've got to tell the truth. They say, Martin, you're not going to live that long. Martin said, it's not the longevity of my life, but it's the quality of my living. I want to be true to what I learned in Atlanta. I want to be true to what I learned in the school, which it has to do with the quality of my service and the depth of my love for others, beginning with the least of these, echoing the 25th chapter of Matthew. That's the Martin Luther King Jr. we've got to keep track of. And he is disturbing to each and every one of us. Anytime I hear folk talking about Martin Luther King Jr. with a nice big smile on their face, I know that they've engaged in the Santa Clausification of Martin. He made him into Santa Claus, a big smile on his face with toys in his bag, handing out everybody smiling. No, he was a revolutionary Christian. And when you really really love poor people, when you really love folk who at the moment are weak and vulnerable, you can't stand the fact that they're being treated unjustly. You loathe the fact they're being treated unfairly, and if you don't do something and say something, the rocks are going to cry out. That's the kind of Martin Luther King Jr. that we're talking about. 